Thank you. We're now going to segue into a, um, our first conversation on the resilient city and rethinking the urban landscape. I'd like to introduce, and if you could go ahead and uh, come on up, uh, Kate Benfield, who's the Director of Sustainable Communities at the National Resources Defense Council. He's, Kate is also the co-founder of the Lead Rating System for Neighborhood Development, the co-founder of the Smart Growth America Coalition, and he writes frequently for the America Cities uh, uh, channel blog on the Atlantic website, which is really terrific. Um, we also will have Justin Hollander, who is Assistant Professor of Urban Environmental Policy and Planning at Tufts University, studies public policy issues of land management and environmental changes associated with economic decline. Uh, Justin wrote a, a book called a timely book called Sunburn Cities, The Great Recession, Depopulation, and Urban Planning in the American Sun Belt. And uh, Sandra will also join us in this conversation. Um, Alicia's asked me to read a couple of these uh, cards that you filled out when you came in. Uh, name one resilient character, real or fictional, explain why, and somebody, uh, it's anon anonymous, um, wrote Mickey Mouse. That's a good one, a classic Disney character to span the ages. And of course, oh, this one's fantastic, Wiley Coyote, a protagonist with nine million lives. There's somebody who fits the, the Chur Churchill's definition of success, right? Going from failure to failure with enthusiasm. So why don't I uh, move over here. I should have mentioned that uh, just, Justin is now to my left, <laughs> correct? Yes. And, and this is Kate, welcome. So maybe Justin, if we could start off with, with you and if you could um, try to help us define what a resilient city looks like. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a topic that is actually of, of strong interest to me, and I've been thinking about these questions for a long time. I'm not sure how much I've used that, that word, resilient, but it's Now's a good time to start. <laughs> I'll start, <laughs> start now. Yeah, as opposed to sustainable, sustainable city? Uh, yeah, yeah, sustainable. Um, stable, right. that's another thing. That's a good one. That's another word I, I like to use a lot. Um, but the kind of work that I've done has been focused at the local government level, primarily looking at at how neighborhoods change. And so early in my career, I spent a lot of time looking at cities and towns that were growing. And as they had more people, more jobs moved to areas, they had more housing, more shopping centers, more roads. And, and what we did was, as a planner, we, we embraced this concept of smart growth. And smart growth said that there is a way that you can manage this change that was happening in a way that can basically preserve the, the quality of your environment to, to the points made earlier. And, and that you don't have to change who you are as a city, as a town. You can manage it. And, and smart growth has a lot to do with making sure there's a lot of different options for, for transportation, so public transit, walking, biking. It has to do with the idea of mixes of uses. Uh, so it's not like just, oh, this is a residential neighborhood. But it's, maybe there's something close by that's, that's uh, retail, or maybe there's some office close by. And so that was smart growth. And then later, more recently in my career, I've really been more interested in the flip side, which is what, what happens to cities when they start to lose population, lose jobs, right. and then what does it mean to, to manage that change in a way that's going to preserve the quality of life for the people who are there, and so they don't have to, they don't have to change. Yes, this notion of, of managing decline smartly, I think, is, is quite interesting because we tend to always, uh, even if we, do, we buy into the idea that um, resources are limitless in America, we, there's this effort to, to think about smart growth, but that still presupposes, because we're Americans, that there's always going to be growth. But of course, in a lot of urban areas, that's not been the case. And how you manage that seems uh, almost more compelling in a way than places that are, that are growing that, that might have more resources and such. But is it all about, um, let me, let me, uh, Turn to you, Kate, because uh, I was struck reading some of the things that you've written that uh, Atlanta is apparently a, uh, a beacon of hope on <laughs> some of these issues, which, you know, Atlanta, um, and I confess I don't spend much time there, but you always, it's, it's it, you know, over the 
decades is often pointed to as one of the culprits of sprawl, and, and now it seems there are good ideas coming out of Atlanta? Well, I, 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 well first I'll echo that I am uh, very happy to be here and, and, and join uh, all of us uh, for a really interesting program. Um, I think Atlanta is an interesting case because it's both a beacon of despair and a beacon of hope. <laughs> and I, I, to some extent, the despair has driven the hope so that I, I think Chris Leinberger called Atlanta perhaps the fastest expanding human settlement in history. And uh, as a result, and all the problems that call, come with uh, sprawl and transportation patterns and eating up the landscape and all of those things. Uh, there has been some very interesting innovation in, in Atlanta. Uh, uh, some projects that I'm particularly fond of are the uh, sort of iconic now uh, brownfield uh, revitalization called uh, Atlantic Station, uh, which is prospering in uh, midtown Atlanta. And one of the country's most interesting uh, sustainability and smart growth projects is something called the Atlanta Beltline, which uh, is a repurposing of a 22-mile uh, railroad loop around downtown Atlanta. And the idea is to convert that into a loop of parks and transit that would spur revitalization of some of the most distressed neighborhoods in Atlanta along its uh, uh, route and at the same time create some 5,000 uh, units of workforce housing. So it's really a, a, a brilliant idea that's going to take both capital and political will to implement. But uh, I'm pretty excited about some of the things that are going on there. And, and do you have sort of an, an elevator pitch definition of the term resilient? Or do you find that resilience is a helpful concept in um, thinking about cities? I, I, I will invoke my friend Steve Muzon, who, who wrote a book called Original Green, which I, I think is one of the most important books uh, on sustainability uh, over the last decade or so. Steve's definition is, can you keep it going in a healthy way into an uncertain future? <laughs> and I think that sums it up about right. as well as, as any of us can. And that encompasses the, the notion of flexibility, which, which you referred to, Senator. You mentioned that in your talk, Senator, that um, uh, crises are contagious, yeah. uh, which is kind of a, a very uh, sobering uh, way to think about it. But we, we see it clearly in this, in this shrinking world. But are, are good ideas and best practices and successes equally contagious? Uh, that's a really difficult one. Um, Give me some hope here. Yeah, I, th I think they are. But I think because you work against a certain inertia, you actually have to get them going with such momentum that they can become contagious. Uh, one of the things in, in the work that I've done on sort of innovation uh, that became really important, if you study case studies, for example, of industrial innovation, when things are really new, you need to change minds. You need to get people to adopt a different mindset about things that they've been doing traditionally. That calls into question those people's identities. Those are very important to them because they have built on them for most of their career. So what you need to do is you need to create what we call scaffolding structures to get sufficient momentum going and to reinforce the new sufficiently so that it can actually take off. And I think that is something which in the sustainability debate is a really important element. We have this conference next week in London with most sustainability scientists from all over the world. And one of the main issues there is we have talked about this for so long. Why has there not been more collective action? And I think some of that has to do with these issues of identity change, creating new structures that are sort of in parallel initially to our existing structures, but that allow that momentum to actually grow, to become contagious. And a last element is 
If you look at cities over the long term time, they are by far the most resilient thing humans have created. Mm -hmm. They are there since 5000 BC and they keep growing. Now the question is, is that in itself continue to be a possibility? And it only is a possibility as long as we start innovating. So I would argue that in your case, what is happening clearly is that Atlanta is hitting a tipping point where despair has come in certain areas to be so big that people actually really start innovating. And I think that's another part of that whole dilemma. When you mention that in Europe, certain uh, you know, uh, urban design practices have taken hold uh, or forms of planning as a result of people's uh, higher comfort level with the idea that resources are finite. Um, I think we, ha we all have sort of a vague sense of the kinds of things that you're talking about, but are, are there a few concrete examples of, of uh, urban planning mechanisms uh, that, are, that are firmly rooted in Europe that we could import? Well, firmly rooted is a flexible sort of concept, uh, <laughs> but I can give you a couple of examples. Um, one of them is in Stockholm, where they are creating whole new parts of the city on a totally different energy concept that is a lot smarter than the actual one. Another one that I'm more personally involved with is a new city in Holland, located between Amsterdam, Utrecht, The Hague, and Rotterdam, next to the airport of Schiphol, where the whole structure of that city is now being thought from the green perspective. And that caves comes up with completely different kind of building structures, road construction, density measures, everything there is being rethought and tried to put into what is a smart kind of urbanization. Now, my point was a little bit more general. It is that Europeans are much more used to regulation because they have needed that arbitration of scarce resources for such a long time. So it is easier in some ways to impose regulation than it is here. At least that is my perception of it. I was, gonna, I was thinking as, as you were talking, I'm not, I was trying to think about, is there any space left between Amsterdam and The Hague? And <laughs> yeah, it turns out that, that they have, have a little, like big little bit and that they're going to fill that up too. It's going to be a very vertical city then? Uh, yeah, to some yeah. extent, yeah. Okay. Uh, Justin, are there going to be lasting consequences uh, from this financial crisis, which is so much tied to uh, the crisis of our, around our housing stock and uh, land use issues. Um, you know, as, as we move out of, hopefully, knock on, on wood, of the Great Recession, um, you know, 10, 20 years from now, are there gonna be ways in which, uh, you know, urban planning and, you know, innovations in cities that people will be able to trace back to this moment in time, or is this going to be seen as a lost opportunity? Wow, what a, what a great question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is definitely a time where there's a lot of attention focused on these, these issues of scarcity, these issues of climate change. And, um, but so quickly, that can get swept up, and, and people will be all excited about the new, exciting ideas. And so, um, I, I think I'm going to have to say lost opportunity. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I don't have the optimism. To I saw a headline otherwise. somewhere yesterday about are, have Americans fallen in love with McMansions? And you mm. do see, to, to see there's a lot of, you know, some momentum around mixed use uh, places of the type that you were describing, uh, although I guess some of that predated the, the, the immediate crisis. But this idea, in terms of how to address the housing crisis, there's a lot of talk in Washington about, you know, the administration should do more to, to allow people to, you know, meet their, their obligations and not foreclose. Uh, but it doesn't seem like you get beyond that type of discussion on how to handle this crisis. You know, and I know you've written um, about some more imag imaginative proposals in terms of how to take advantage, if taking advantage is the right way to talk about a crisis. Uh, what would you like to see happen, how would you like the discourse in Washington to be different around these issues? Yeah, I, mean, I think a, a longer view of what tends to be a cyclical process of growth and decline that occur in just about every city in the history of the world, you can correct me, but I mean, it, the, this longer view that suggests that 
cities will have times when they're growing and they'll have times when they're shrinking. And that during the periods of growth, there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that that community does not have the, that negative outcome, the famines that, that um, we learned about in Australia. Um, and then during the times of decline that we can retrofit that urban environment, that we can uh, reconfigure it, right size it, if you will, in a way that's going to be able to preserve that resilient character. And the exact details of how you do that, I mean, I think need, need to be made at the neighborhood level, at the local level, the people who live in these places. Um, but uh, there is a role for government, federal, state, local governments to create processes that empower people to help make those decisions and not to just say, well, this is our zoning. And this has always been our zoning for the last 50 years, so let's just keep it. Zoning can be a tool to reinvent the blueprint of a, of a community. And in times of depopulation, economic distress, zoning can be rethought of and reinvented. Do you, do you have an Atlanta that you like to point to as a uh, beacon of despair slash hope? <laughs> despair slash hope. Or a case study where you find something particularly interesting happening in, in the US on these issues? Well, I've actually, I've actually been spending a couple of years doing research in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is um, just uh, southeast of Boston. It uh, was the whaling capital of the world in the 19th century, Moby Dick took place there. This is a, a fascinating city that went through those, those very same periods of boom and bust that I was talking about. And over the last 80 years, it's been steadily losing population. So you could read about all the statistics, you could read all about the history, and you could say, I'm, I'm afraid to go. I mean, <laughs> if you just said, a terrible place, why would I ever want to go? But if you could somehow overcome that and you go, it is a lovely city. It is a city that is teeming with economic activity and people and parks and historic sites and, and you wouldn't know it. And so what I've been doing is studying how it is that the city has essentially managed that process. And I, I came up with a term, I call it urban absorption, that the city has essentially absorbed those vacant spaces that have been left behind because of fewer buildings and, and filled up fewer fewer people. And so that process is something that I've been able to document in New Bedford. I'm actually writing a book about that right now, and, um, but I, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to, to talk more about it. It's interesting. My, my first job in journalism was in Pittsburgh uh, in the mid-90s, and that's, another, that's a city that, yes. uh, yeah. you know, you could argue is, has managed decline, I mean, just in the sheer sense of population loss, uh, yeah. gracefully, um, yeah. and it's kind of altered economic base. Um, Sandra, one of the things that uh, is interesting about your work is that you have such a, a wide lens perspective on this, having done, I, I saw one of your talks on uh, the fate of the cities in Mac, well, it's now Mexico, Teotihuacan and Chichen Itza, and are, you, so you talk about the resilience of the cities as a concept, but of course many cities uh, weren't so resilient themselves, and for reasons that we don't often understand yet, although you've, you've spent some time studying this, is it usually envirom the environment question that leads to the death of cities? I need to first clarify something that I said. I think urbanization is a very resilient yes. thing. Urban systems are extremely resilient. Individual cities, can clearly collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, I will not speculate about the reasons for the collapse of a place like Teotihuacan. One of the things that we very often see in er early urban situations is that there is such an afflux of people that after a while that creates all those unintended consequences and organizational talent is not capable of dealing with it. And so that then means that people lose interest in actually being part of the city, and they go and do something else. They move away. In this particular case, it may well be that they move to secondary cities, and that after a while, in the Valley of Mexico, you get Tenochtitlan, which then becomes the dominant city. So you see a flux, a flux there as well. But I would like to refer to another study that we have done in Europe. We took at one point five and a half thousand uh, municipalities in the southern half of France. 
And we looked for the European Union at where they could most effectively <laughs> invest to actually further the development of that region. And so you came up with four categories of cities, the ones that would be a total loss in any case, the ones that would absolutely be a win in any case, and two intermediate categories that were just around the boundary and where we tried to say, well, those are the ones that you need to invest in. And the characteristics that we came up with to determine individual cases are the age uh, profile of the population, and in particular the working population, the diversity of crafts and this, the diversity of innovation potential that is available, and the, div the diversity of resources around the city, natural resources, and the connectivity with a road network. Those were the four dominant elements by which you could actually predict which cities would collapse and which would not. And so that might help in this particular discussion some. Uh, we can see about that. Great. Kate, do you care to speculate on the reasons why uh, Dotiwakan fell? I know you're eager to. <laughs> well, actually, what I'm, what, what I'm eager to join is, is the uh, conversation about shrinking cities for a moment, because I, I have a different perspective on, on that issue than uh, a, a number of people in the, in the area do. I think in the U.S. we have a, a funny definition of cities in our <coughs> discourse, and they are typically defined by arcane boundaries that were, you know, def that were drawn, you know, hundreds of years ago, that no longer have any reference to either the economy or the environment. The real cities in the United States, and I suspect elsewhere, although I'm not expert uh, elsewhere, are metropolitan areas now. So I think we have to look at what's going on in cities and metropolitan areas. If you look at Pittsburgh's metropolitan area population, it's been stable for 50 years. Um, if you look at all of the so-called uh, shrinking cities, you will find that their developed land area has not been shrinking, but expanding and in some cases expanding rather dramatically. Uh, so what you have is that parts of the city are expanding and parts are shrinking. Uh, so the question is what to do about that. And my contention is that as long as we look only within the boundaries of the jurisdictional central city to try to make those places more resilient, we will fail. If we look at the metropolitan area. I mean, I think what needs right-sizing are the suburbs, not so much right. the central cities. Uh, so uh, I, I just I have I have a different view about that as, as to why uh, a, a city in Mexico may have failed. I, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> let me let, um, <laughs> let me ask you. Uh, you know, it's one of those things you, you, could, you could speculate on because nobody knows, right? But let me ask you, uh, organizations like the NRDC uh, that have been uh, quite effective at galvanizing uh, awareness around environmental issues, uh, you know, but perhaps not so effective so as to alter the way we think about the, the limits to growth of these metropolitan areas. And as you said, uh, you know, even in... And, and that's an important clarification. In a lot of these shrinking cities, the metropolitan area isn't shrinking, and in some ways, the jurisdictional boundaries uh, expand it uh, in order to leapfrog political constraints to growth. Um, do you feel that uh, organizations like yours are gaining traction in this issue, in this, on this subject of how we should approach urban development? And what's the, uh, you know, we, again, we, we, we sort of stipulated earlier that the Europeans are doing this in a way that we are not. Is that true? Is that going to change? Well, I, I do think it's true that the Europeans are ahead of us. I don't, I don't think there's much question about that. Um, I also think that the smart growth agenda that Justin uh, referred to uh, earlier is now mainstream in every planning office in the country. So I, I, I think there has been a, a, a great uh, uh, amount of progress on that. Uh, I, I do most of my work at either the regional level or the neighborhood level. Uh, I've seen more progress at the neighborhood level than at the regional level. 
Uh, but I do think there's a lot of progress. I wouldn't claim sole credit as NRDC for making that happen. I think we are uh, privileged to be part of a conversation and a network that together, I think, is making, making it happen. And I think that the changing demographics in the country are going to propel us further in that direction uh, as uh, the millennials reach uh, home purchasing age at the same time that the baby boomers are retiring and neither one really is a prime market for large lot suburbia. The demand for the kinds of living that I think and probably the rest of us on the panel think are more resilient, that demand is, is going to go up and the demand for large lot suburbia uh, I think is, is already going down if you look at what's happening to, to home values and the geography uh, of that. To, to tie it to the uh, financial crisis that you spoke of earlier, I think that the uh, slump in real estate has, has hurt both good development and bad development. Uh, but I think it's hurt bad development worse than it's hurt good development. So in a sense, uh, it, it hasn't been a net problem for sustainability. I think it's probably been a net gain for sustainability, uh, which is not to say that I advocate. <laughs> <laughs> well, be, before I start asking about the Mayans, I think I need to open it up to uh, questions and comments. And, and even before I do that, I want to have a shout, do a shout out for Joel Garo, who is uh, my uh, chief co-conspirator in putting these together. And, and actually contributed some really good reporting and uh, thinking on this issue of how metropolitan areas grow with a, a book that focused on edge cities. So, uh, Joel, if you have a question, you can, you can go first. Otherwise, I will don't mean to put you on the spot. You can think about it. <laughs> um, questions, comments? Joel or anybody else? Here in the, th in the third row. Sorry. Wait, uh, I'm sorry, just again. My because name is George broadcast, Smith. wait for the microphone George and introduce Smith. yourself, please. Phoenix Partnership. Uh, I'm a French citizen resident in Norway, moving to the United States. I was involved specifically in Sweden, Norway, France, and Japan. Now, in, uh, my point is it's what you said about identity. In Sweden, they don't have villages for the last 200 years, a deliberate decision. So was for the last 200 years focused on developing urban Whereas in Norway, they had a totally different valley-based type of development. <coughs> Therefore, my question is, how do you, and Japan techniques, so how do you integrate in these various cases, France, Sweden, Norway, Japan, the idea of identity, cultural identity, natural identity, and how do you integrate it in your practical recommendations. Uh, I remember for UNESCO Task Force for Intangible Cultural Heritage, and our conclusion at this stage is that the identity is crucial. So if you compare the Jews and the Gypsies, you might have some too extreme there, but they, uh, it's something happened to make the uh, desert blossom and to survive across the world like the Gypsy, why? So this is a sustainability issue. I don't know what resili resilience it is, but it's still there. Do you want me to answer? I'm happy to. Um, look, I, I'll talk to you now, not as an archeologist, but as a cultural anthropologist, because I had some training in that as well, and some substantive field experience in the desert in Syria, in the Philippines, and in other places. I think, the biggest problem has been that identity has been ignored in globalization. And that therefore we have strived through consumerism for a normalized globalization. And we have, and that is now leading to all kinds of counter movements, clearly, uh, in whatever part of the world you're now talking about. But we are beginning to see that our ideas of development need to take identity into account, collective identity into account. And I think that makes some of the difference, it's certainly the difference between Sweden and Norway that you're talking about. But in France, again, it's not only actually national identity, it's the South versus the North. 
It is all those kinds of issues. Breaking down identities is incredibly complicated. And in some ways, maybe that adds to the resilience because it may become under pressure, but then ultimately it resurges. If you look at acculturation studies, you can actually even sort of begin to think about which elements a particular culture with a particular identity will accept and which ones it will actually not accept and either ignore or suppress or something else. So my main point here is the not taking identity into account is a huge problem in this whole set of issues. Joel, do you have some? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Joel Garrow with New America and ASU, and I wrote a book called Edge City Years, which is the Q, right? So, um, all right, so, so as you say, you know, uh, metropolitan areas are expanding, even if the old industrial downtowns sometimes are shrinking. Edge cities like Tyson's Corner and like the Dulles area, the ones we all know, and, and all of Phoenix, for that matter, um, is... Uh, can be seen as a resilient response of an adaptive people to the problems of the old industrial downtowns. Now, I know planners hate these places uh, because they're all ad hoc. Do you think that edge cities are doomed, or do you think we're going to invent something else, and if so, is that resilient? Well, I think we'll find out in Tyson's Corner because uh, that was the perhaps most iconic of the edge cities that you profiled in, in your book. And for those of you who are out of town, it, it, it's uh, uh, in suburban Virginia, uh, here outside of, of, of DC in this absolute chaos. <laughs> as, as Joel said, everything urban planners hate. But it's now the subject of a retrofit uh, that's very ambitious by uh, uh, Fairfax County to uh, take advantage of four new uh, mass transit stops that are going to be uh, built in, uh, in, in adjacent to Tyson's Corner to spur a more walkable design uh, in what is now a very unwalkable place. And I think that will take a, a number of, of decades, but we'll find out whether Tyson's resilience is a resilience for the 21st century or whether it's stuck in the 20th. Can I ask a yeah. quick answer to as well? Um, there was an interesting study maybe about 10 years ago, Rob Lang and the folks at Brookings about what they called the uh, Boombergs. So these were booming suburbs, and they did this analysis nationally, found those places that were, su they were substantial in size. Um, they were not right in the, in the core of the metro area. So they, they weren't exactly edge cities, but very close. And um, I revisited those Boombergs. Um, in the last six years, the vast majority of them have lost have a net loss in, in housing units. So that means a, a substantial vacancy and abandonment what in these kinds of places. Of well, throughout the whole Phoenix area, um, west of, in, in um, the Central Valley, California, um, coastal Florida. Um, and so, I mean, I have a report uh, that I published with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. That's on my, a link is on my website. And, you could check that out, but yeah. So there's definitely a, a, a problem with, with with these places because I think that they boom too much, and and they busted. To, um, towards the middle, gentlemen. Um, first of all, uh, this is Mike McDonald, Global Health Initiatives. I'm wondering um, if there is any kind of map, a uh, global map of carrying capacity of ecosystems. Um, secondly, I'm a little concerned that uh, we are going toward times in which uh, many of the ecosystems do not support the population, so that there's actually a resource, an absolute resource constraint that will kill cities, um, and you see population declines. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think uh, of the uh, networks that are emerging, uh, resilience networks, transition town movements, um, and how we're seeing Occupy emerge and revolutions take down large systems quickly. Is it possible there's a new form of organization that could take us uh, into some kind of balance with the ecosystems that may, may be failing? 
Well, I, I would. <laughs> I think all of you could. Yeah. Uh, by saying with respect to carrying capacity and the finite limit of resources, and you make a good point there. I think cities are the solution, not the problem. Uh, cities are much more efficient environmentally in the way that they use resources than are, for instance, sprawling suburbs. And I, I think that the only way that we are going to be uh, uh, resilient and uh, appropriately responsive to these finite resources uh, is to focus on urban systems. A couple of things. Um, one on your sort of maps of carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is totally determined also by the techniques that are available. And so it's very difficult to give you an absolute map. You can give relative maps and you can give maps that are related to particular kinds of ways of exploiting. I think that is an important element in this. Then I think one other element is that you have to realize that the suburbs, of course, have been created at a time since the Industrial Revolution, basically, when energy was not a fundamental constraint to society. All the cities that are older than that had that as a major constraint. And that is why people walked them rather than drove them. And so this whole energy balance here plays a huge role. Now, I also believe that this movement, in particular of the transi transition cities and so on, is actually become quite powerful and is leading, in, particularly in Britain, but now also in this country, to all kinds of bottom-up inventions that deal with local situations and that are therefore better adapted to the circumstances than anything that could be devised top down. And so that shift in itself, I think, in people locally taking their own fate in their own hands is actually, I think, a very, very positive thing in all of this. Last of all, just one remark also to, to you, Tyson's Corner and things like that. Of course, it's interesting that we have always focused on the dynamic the dynamics of cities as a whole. And of course, a lot of the most important dynamics are actually at those edges. And so it is very interesting to, from a different perspective, to start studying the transitions from non-urban to urban at the edges of cities. And I wonder whether that would actually have some clues as to the questions you were raising. Let's take uh, two more. Um, third row here on this side. Thanks. My name is Kimberly Crichton, and like you, I've had um, training in cultural anthropology. And what uh, caused me to be so interested is living in Gothenburg, Sweden, and then living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So Boston is really a mess concern, uh, compared with Gothenburg, which is a planned city, Boston, which has always been an unplanned city, but they were started at the same time. Um, uh, and I wonder whether you've done any study of planned cities and what the results are. I can, I can say one little thing. I think planned cities were unsuccessful until essentially the Industrial Revolution. We have a number of cases of planned cities from the 16th and 17th century in France, for example. They've all been deserted. There has been no capability to maintain the system, in part because those systems were not sufficiently wired into a wider footprint than uh, the later cities are. There are some really successful examples in Britain. There are some total failures as well. Milton Keynes has always been dragged ahead as the big success story uh, in Britain. I think you need to do, if you plan that, to take a number of factors into account that aren't usually taken into account. And that is that the location of where you plan is absolutely fundamental to the success or not of a planned city. And there's others, but I'll just leave it at that one for the moment. Uh, I I am not a big fan of new planned cities. Uh, I think that we have uh, so much space for development uh, within the footprint of our existing uh, metropolitan areas that it would be 
really a waste of resources to go out in the middle of nowhere and try to create something new. Uh, and, and, and if you look at the history of recently planned cities, and, and, and my knowledge of this is not nearly as, as long range as, as, as yours, Sander, um, they have basically turned out to be com commuter suburbs in, 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 in almost every case. And uh, I, I just, I, I think there's a lot of utopian idealis idealism about new planned cities, but when I look at something like you know Mazdar and, and other other places, I, I, I just think no matter how good the technology is, you know, this is not completely dependent on technology. And uh, I would much prefer that we have well planned neighborhoods and developments uh, within our metropolitan areas uh, before we go out and create new ones. Okay. Um, last question on the edge there, in honor of edge cities. Hi, I'm Jamie Ewalt. I'm a PhD student um, studying resilience um, at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, my question is, in the resilience literature, it, it talks about being able to absorb or respond to disturbance and continue functioning. And in the sustainability literature, it's looking at well-being current and future generations. In your work, how do you define functioning, and is it definable? And then how do you define well-being, and is it definable? Functioning? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to take that, because so often in the urban planning world, we, we use measures like population growth, um, or we use measures like income or poverty level. Um, and so there's been a real growing interest in, in economics and then splitting out elsewhere to look at happiness. And so here what you're doing is you're really just essentially asking people um, how satis they are, satisfied they are with their, with their life. Um, and there's actually pretty good data out there to be able to look over time. And I did a, a, a short study where I looked at that and, and saw no correlation between how happy people were and whether the population was changing, either growing or, or shrinking in that in that city. So I think that there's, there's that's, a place, that's kind of like a potential starting off point. I, I do think that there are some very interesting kind of emerging indicators of, uh, of, of what would constitute a uh, well-functioning, happy, if you will, uh, place. And, and one uh, think tank that I've run across is called the Healing Cities Institute uh, that was founded by a a guy named Mark Holland, who was the sustainability director at the city of Vancouver uh, before going into this. And I, I'll just read you a very quick list of, of their eight principles for uh, a healing cities. Whole communities, meaning that they're complete in their parts, conscious mobility, restorative architecture, thriving landscapes, integrated infrastructure, nourishing food systems, a supportive society, and healthy prosperity. We could spend the rest of the day talking <laughs> about all of those things, but I throw them yeah. out because I think they're interesting. Healthy prosperity. <laughs> well, on that, on that note, thank you. Uh, this has been a great conversation, and sorry to have to cut it off. Thanks. <laughs>